you know, the closest thing I've ever sort of come up with is, is it's like a decision tree, right? Like you need, we're trying to help people follow this pathway of thinking about their house. Um, you know, make sure you've answered these questions. Um, we don't want to tell people what to do. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Pro Talk podcast, a regular discussion with building industry professionals. Today, I'm joined by builder Dan Colbert, Portland, Maine. You can find the Fine Home Building Pro Talk podcast and the original Fine Home Building podcast at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast, where you can also leave feedback and ask questions. Dan, it is a pleasure to meet you in person. Thank you so much for being on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. So you listened to the show and you still agreed to be on it. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> I figured I needed to class up the joint a little bit. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> so, uh, you healthy? I, I think I heard today that you got your your COVID vaccine. Is that correct? I did this morning. Very exciting. Unless it, it is all, exciting. Unless it was all an elaborate April Fool's joke. <laughs> did you have to wait a long time? Was it a big deal? Uh, today, you mean, or in general? Yeah. No, today uh, they actually had a very uh, well run uh, assembly line there. I was impressed. Cool. Has that made it difficult to do business? Yeah, it's been, uh, you know, I mean, partly just the anxiety. We shut down for about a month or so, you know, a year ago, um, along with everybody else. And, uh, I mean, we've been lucky in that the two big jobs we've had since then have both been unoccupied, a new house. And uh, we've been, we're just finishing up adding a floor to a cape in Portland. So, uh, you know, we've been lucky in that, in that we haven't had a lot of like kitchen renos to do in occupied houses, but you know, the subs are a mixed bag in terms of how well they're behaving. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's a general anxiety of not knowing if what we're doing is safe. Um, and then, you know, there's all the other stuff too, obviously that everybody's experiencing the supply chain. And so what have you specifically had trouble getting? Um, I don't know that I've had, let's, let me think about that for a sec. I mean, everything is taking longer, uh, to get, I don't know that I've been unable to get anything. Um, but a lot of stuff is, you know, a lot of stuff I've just had to wait a long time for. Um, How do you absorb the cost of that, Dan, when you're like your projects, your, 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 the amount your money is based on your expectation of a certain amount of a time for a project to take. Right. And it, when it takes longer, what do you do? Uh, you don't make any money. Yeah. It's quite simple. <laughs> yeah. That's no, this, you... this past year has not been particularly lucrative. Yeah. I believe it. Yeah. Um, can you tell me how you became a contractor? You have somewhat of a unique niche in the, in the Portland uh, market. Let's, we'll talk about that in a little uh -oh. bit, but can you tell me how you got into this weird business? Uh, well, I got into construction, um, you know, right out of college. I, I just sort of stumbled into a summer job immediately after graduating. Uh, and I was really happy to be doing something concrete after, you know, having been a student for whatever, 16 years or whatever it is at that point. Um, uh, and did you have any exposure to it before that? Not really. None. I mean, minimal, but no, certainly nothing professional. I never had a summer job in the trades or anything. Um, but I liked it, uh, you know, and I, whatever. And I, I think I was reasonably, you know, it was something that I felt I had a certain talent for or whatever. And uh, yeah, so I just have never figured out anything better to do. Um, and then, um, you know, like most contractors, like many contractors, uh, you sort of get sick of dealing with other people's mistakes or, you know, the the the... the the landscape is littered with mediocre construction companies. So after a while, you figure if I'm going to, if I'm going to be making all these mistakes, I might as well be making them for myself instead of. And how long did you work for other people before you decided to plunge in with your own business? Uh, it was probably about a decade. Uh, and I, you uh, felt like you had learned enough or no, did you? I mean, no. I mean, I, I thought I did in retrospect. No. Um, I, I, you know, one of my regrets is I never worked for like a really fantastic company. Um, 
And I don't think I realized that. And uh, only I've only realized that in retrospect, right? I never, I mean, you know, I haven't been a carpenter in a long time, but you know, I never like, I never got to be a great carpenter uh, because I never, you know, I never worked for companies where there were great carpenters teaching people. Um, you know, I had some good employers at the very beginning, um, but then I worked for, you know, the usual round of bozos. Um, and, uh, so anyway, that's my, that's my regret is that. Has it been both remodeling and new construction? Have you, uh, I know your current business does both, but w- when you were a young employee, were you doing both kinds of building? Yeah. Yeah. Mostly, I think mostly new construction. Do you think that prepared you to be a remodeler for, uh, uh, good clients? Um, No, I mean, nothing, you know, whatever. I, it's it's very hard to say that you're ever really prepared, right? I mean, unless you really go, unless you're smarter than me or you're just more methodical or whatever, and you work for a good company and you just absorb the stuff there is to absorb. But most of us just get tired of working for other people. So we go out on our own and we discover there's a whole lot there we have no idea how to deal with. Um, you know, I've done enough renovation that the work itself I could handle uh, you know, but there was a lot of figuring out as I went along in the early years. Um, yeah. And are you, uh, a native Mainer? Is that how you ended up starting your business in Portland? No, I, um, I grew up in the suburbs of New York actually. And then I went to college in Connecticut, not far from you guys. And, um, then I was sort of looking for something to do uh, and somewhere else to go. I, I was in central Connecticut and it wasn't, you know, wasn't much, wasn't much of a fun place to be as a as person in your early 20s. Um, so anyway, I sort of narrowed it down to Burlington or Portland and I picked ocean over lake, basically. Um, and I've liked it. It turned out, you know, I really I love Portland. And How long has it been now? Oh, God, it was 88 when I moved here, so 30-something years now. You know, in any conversation of progressive building, Portland, Maine, despite being a small city, is always identified as one of the uh, linchpins of the progressive building movement. How did that happen? Why there? It's a weird thing to It is a weird thing. So when I got here, uh, mid-coast Maine, you know, the sort of Belfast, Rockland area and inland was where like the groovy building was going on. And I think maybe it was sort of the aging hippies were still doing stuff. Um, They have largely kind of aged out of it. Um, But there was a big back to the land movement here, uh, you know, like there was in Vermont. Um, So I think a lot, some of those people went into the trades and were doing some cool building. I have a theory. I have no idea if it's correct, but we, uh, we were one of the original pilot sites for lead for homes um and we had a big uh very active uh u.s green building council chapter in maine and it was focused in portland um and i think a lot of people coalesced around that both of those um we've got some of the first lead rated homes in the u.s in southern maine um And then the Green Building Council chapter, you know, a lot of people that you think of when you think of Portland and good building, especially on the architecture side, were very involved in that scene. You know, there were a lot of relatively young builders and architects at that time, too. And I think that uh, the combination of the two just, you know, a bunch of us got the bug. Um, And maybe it's a main thing. Like, I don't think of us as being particularly competitive um, I think that we were all happy to have found each other and help each other out. Um, you're talking the builders in this, in this community of, of progressive, uh, construction. Yeah. Yeah. And architects too. And yeah, I mean, I think we were all just excited to be doing new stuff that felt more useful than the stuff we'd been doing before that. Um, so I guess, I mean, honestly, I don't, I, I really don't know. Because you're right, it's a, we're a teeny place, right? I mean, Maine is very small. I mean, Maine is very big, but a very small population. Greater Portland only has, you know, 75,000 people. It's, it's not, yeah, it's, 
it's kind of it's money. cool, but it's it's weird. Why there? Yeah. So, uh, folks who are familiar with the work probably realize or know about you that you're a proponent of the Pretty Good House movement. Was that uh, an evolution of these uh, progressive building techniques that you were seeing around you, or is was yeah. it a response to other uh, programs, uh, efficiency programs? Right. Some of both. It, it, its genesis was we've been doing this uh, building science discussion group uh, in Portland for over a decade now. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, I, I've been the moderator the whole time. And Steve Constantino, who runs Performance Building, you know, a lot of people may know him because they've ordered windows from him in the past, Shuko and before that, Intus. Um, and he's actually the big Sega distributor too. Anyway, we, it meets at his store. Uh, and so every month, you know, we come up with a topic and typically it's at the last second. Uh, and it usually involves a bad joke. And this was no exception where, you know, I've been thinking, I think it originally started, you know, Passive House is very big in Maine. And I have, you know, somewhat mixed feelings about it, which I'm happy to go into later. But anyway, I was thinking about rating systems and I said, well, what, you know, what if you just want to build a pretty good house? Um, so that was the name of that session. And uh, we had a great discussion and Mike Maines wrote it up for uh, GBA under Martin Holiday. And uh, it just, you know, it caught on like wildfire. I don't know if the stupid the name. name, because it makes a lot of sense. It's right. But we it's, had great discussions on GBA. If you look up his original, if you look up his original uh, post on it on GBA, I think there's like well over a hundred comments on it. Um, you know, Martin was a big booster, so uh, there were a bunch of articles and a lot of discussion about it on his site. So if there's really, you know, if there's really a, uh, a handmaiden to the movement, I have to say it was Martin and GBA. That's cool. And can you tell folks some of the tenants of the, and of course, uh, the Pretty Good House program is not a program in the true right. sense. Right. So can you tell me what some of the general tenants are of folks who want to build pretty good homes? Yeah. So the first thing is that we have a website, uh, prettygoodhouse.org or .com. Uh, Bob Swinburne in Vermont put it together uh, about a year or two ago. Um, so there's a lot more information there. Uh, you know, so the basic idea is we're very non-prescriptive, right? I mean, the whole thing is, the whole joke is, you know, send us 50 bucks and we'll send you a pretty good plaque. Um, we want, you know, we've been trying to think about a way, like we had discussions and, you know, we were discussing it in Portland, Maine, Climate Zone 6. So everything we're talking about is, you know, relevant to our area. It's not going to help you too much if you live in Florida. Um, so we are trying to think of like, all right, what are the things you need to think about? So, you know, the closest thing I've ever sort of come up with is, is it's like a decision tree, right? Like you need, we're trying to help people follow this pathway of thinking about their house. Um, you know, make sure you've answered these questions. Um, we don't want to tell people what to do. Um, which is also a very main, uh, ethic yeah. I would guess. Yeah. Yes. For better or worse, it's a very main thing. Um, so, you know, the basic tenets are nothing too shocking, you know, smaller, smaller is better. You know, we were all kind of horrified by the ridiculous explosion in square footage. Um, simple shapes are easier to detail and insulate. Um, but, you know, the shell is critical. Air sealing is critical. Um, you know, get enough R value in that you can s s downsize your mechanicals. Um, yeah, you know, there's a lot, uh, you know, I mean, there's more in there, but sure. Those are the uh, big things. You, you mentioned uh, Passive House earlier, and of course, there are other uh, building performance programs, and uh, Energy Star jumps to mind, and the, perhaps the most extreme uh, living building challenge. Um, what what are your thoughts on those? Are those are those a good thing for uh, people to be tr reaching for? Are, are yeah. those? Yeah, I mean, I you know, I think they're wonderful. I, you know, I think I I, I did a couple of lead houses early on, um, and I love lead for homes. I, I thought it was asking all the right questions, um, and uh, 
you know, Pat's Vest, I have not directly experienced. I've gone down the path a couple of times. Um, with clients or of your own interest? Yeah, no, with clients. And and we ended up, you know, and part of it is, I mean, that's part of where this came from a decade ago. You know, back then, I mean, I know things have changed, but, you know, back then there were a lot of these houses where they were putting, you know, obscene amounts of sub slab foam in just to hit the number. To get a number, to yeah. To get the number, which is what obviously everybody hates about rating systems is gaming the system to get the rating. Um but you know, I think passive, house, especially in multifamily, I think passive house is 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 genius. Um, I love what it. I love the multifamily passive house projects. Living building challenge. We actually have a project that just opened. It's a very cool project. Um, Kaplan Thompson and Bryburn and Scott Simons, I think, is the third architect firm. We're all involved in it, and there were some great builders. Uh, 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 Warren Construction. I can't remember who else. Anyway, it was a very exciting project um, that just opened the ecology school, and I had no direct involvement in it, but I, I know many of the people, so I've heard them talking about it. I, I think Living Building Challenge is, is very cool. I mean, obviously, it's incredibly ambitious, but um, no, I think most of the rating systems are wonderful. I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with them. I just was looking for something that I thought, uh, you know, the discussion was more about how do we move the needle, right? Like how do we? Yeah. Because how many living building challenge homes can you build versus pretty yeah. good homes, right? Or, or whatever. It, it just seems right. like it's, it's a small piece of the pie. Right. It's kind of like deep energy retrofits, uh, which I've done a couple of, and I, and I have a hard time justifying anymore. Um, what brought you around? What made you change your mind on that? And I've read other builders saying similar things recently. So there's a few reasons. One is just it felt like it was a ridiculous amount of money for the payoff. Um, uh, and the other is, um, you know, the whole carbon question, right? I mean, we are, uh, as, you know, as many people before me have pointed out, you know, this is probably the worst moment in human history to be putting carbon into the atmosphere. Uh, something like a deep energy retrofit basically front loads your entire carbon load um, you know, because so. most of them rely on thick layers of exterior foam insulation, right? Is one right. of the or problems. Even whatever, or even cellulose yeah. wood or whatever. But I mean, you're building a house that's going to reduce consumption dramatically by using a lot of resources up front. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't know that that's a good idea. In fact, I think it's probably not a good idea. I mean, I think there are certainly things, you know, like the things like I know tonight is the uh, discussion on um, uh, Jacob Rakusen's book. On uh, BS and beer. Yeah. And I am uh, good friends with Jacob and Ace and uh, the folks at New Framework. And, you know, they're just doing incredible stuff. And, and their whole thing about carbon storage in buildings is just incredibly exciting. And I've learned a huge amount from them. Um, so that, you know, obviously, if you can build a house that is actually storing carbon, that's wonderful. But not a lot of us are doing that either. Um, so anyway, that, you know, between the two of those, um, I think that you can get on a retrofit. I think it's probably relatively easy on most houses to get a dramatic reduction, 30, 50 percent reduction, pushing it beyond that. You know, I don't know if it makes sense. I, I you know, I, I've become a if, if I hadn't if I hadn't come up with the pretty good house joke, uh, my next joke was going to be the shallow energy retrofit. <laughs> Which uh, the appeal of that is you're not having all this embodied energy to do the uh, uh, improvements, the right incremental well, improvements. Even. Cheap, you know, yeah. I mean, and you know, and I like I haven't used the Aero Seal stuff yet, um, but that's got the potential to be huge. If we could, you know, if you can empty out the house, do you know, spend a couple of days on surface prep, and then set off the Aero Seal bomb, um, you know, that would just be incredible. It's uh, it's cool technology. I agree with you. the The problem I understand is that uh, it's very labor intensive to, to protect a house worth of belongings. So if you could move right. all the stuff into pods in the yard or whatever, right. it might make sense. Yeah, it's it is very cool. So you do both uh, new homes and remodeling, as we said earlier. Uh, can you please talk about the remodeling project projects that your sweet spot, and then about the new homes that you like to do? And then I'm going to ask you something else related to that when you're done. Oh boy, <clears throat> something to look forward to. <laughs> um, 
So let's see. Renovation, we are all over the map on renovation. I mean, we do, you know, we're a small company, so we don't get that, you know, we don't do that many jobs. We tend to do, um, we tend to do medium to large jobs. So we don't do that many jobs in a year, um, which is good because I don't really like talking to people that much. So it limits, limits, <laughs> limits the number of clients I have to talk to in a year. Right. Um, so, uh, so we're all over the map. Uh, you know, we really, we do. You addition. do kitchens and baths and. We do kitchens and baths. We do additions. We do whole, you know, we do gut renos. Um, you know, I've had clients, I've worked on their houses for decades now, you know, so we'll do everything from major projects to, you know, emptying out their dryer vents when they get clogged. Do you think there's a secret to getting good long-term clients like that who have you back again and again for different stuff? Well, I think you have to make it clear that you're willing, you know, that you want to be the person they call, that you don't want them dating other people, right? That, mm -hmm. that, that if they call you, you will show up and take care of it. Uh, you know, you have to be somebody that they want to have in their house, too. I mean, I've had, you know, certainly in the last 20 years, I've had who knows how many employees, nobody, and nobody, that I, nobody who's currently working for me has been here longer than, I don't know, three years, I think, two or three years, Um but, you know, I've consistently had really nice people working for me who my clients typically love. So what about like, how do you get them to see the value in what you do instead of shopping for price? Oh, uh, I don't know. I mean, obviously it helps, you know, I mean, we're typically working for people with more money than not. Uh, so that's the more one, money than us, let's say. Right. <laughs> so that's, that's one piece of it is just, you know, I think that they appreciate that we provide a greater value. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I think that it's a funny world, right? We c contractors have a mostly well deserved bad reputation. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we're not particularly valued by the general public. Um, so, so, um, you know, it, it's tough, mm -hmm. to, it's tough to have those two things fighting against each other, um, where people don't, where a large portion of the population does not see that there's any differentiation between one contractor and another one. Is so I guess uh, totally just refusing to deal with the people, you know, you just don't do, I mean, I say no, 15 times for every yes, you know, easily. How do you uh, pre-qualify your clients? How do you, how do you know to say no to? How do you know who that person is? Um, well, largely it's, I mean, partly it's just that we're so busy that if they don't want to wait, you know, if they don't want to wait, then that gets rid of plenty of people. Um, another one is, you know, obviously where are they coming from is always important, right? They, are they repeats? Are they, are they friends of clients of ours? Mm -hmm. You know, are they referrals from our subs? Um, uh, you know, I don't competitive bid, so I weed those people out right away. Um, you know, one of the interesting revelations I had a few years ago, we had these clients, you know, it turned out okay, but we didn't have a great relationship, and they were not people I loved particularly. Um and I realized it was a project that that um, that an architectural firm brought to us. Um, and I've worked with them before and I like them and, you know, but I realized, you know, architects, architects have to be much uh, less picky than contractors. Right. There's a there's a very small, very teeny percentage of the population that's ever going to hire an architect, certainly compared to who's going to um, hire contractors. So. I realized that I could not count on leads from architects being leads I wanted, right? That I needed to do. I sort of assumed like, oh, well, these are vetted clients. And they're certainly vetted in the sense that they have money, but they're not necessarily vetted in terms of, are they people I want to be around for three to six months? It's so tempting, I'm sure, for contractors, especially, especially when they're getting started to take those jobs, whether it's a good fit or not, would you have any advice for how do you resist that temptation? Um, it's hard. You got to eat, right? Yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Do you need to get that? 
No, not <laughs> they, they never answer the phone. Um, it's hard, right? Because you want to you want to yeah, get on the map, and you want right. to make relationships with architects, and you want to do interesting projects with cool details. Right. Like, I'd say that um, I don't know. It's it's very hard for me to give that advice. Oh, for God's sakes. <laughs> I can't, if I was a little more technologically adept, I'd figure out how to turn this off. <laughs> there. All right. I unplugged it. That should do it. Um, yeah, it's been such a long time since I was in that position. It's hard. And it's a different world, right? You've got the internet. Um, I'm very grateful that I established my business for the internet because I think it's done nothing particularly good for contractors. Um, because it becomes a vanity project instead of, no, a... because it, because I think like the whole differentiating yourself online and, and ratings, I hate ratings. I hate all those stupid websites. Um, I, I have actively discouraged my clients from rating me, um, because I just don't want to even be on the radar of these places. Yeah. Um, because you but, get a lot of tire kickers it, who don't share your values, right? Right. Plus the companies are, are, are. Well, I won't, I won't say, I won't say a bad word, but they're, they're, you know, they're, they're sleazy. They're not, in, you know, all these companies pretend that they're vetting contractors, but we all know they're not. And that the only, the only financial model they found that works seems to be some version of payola. Um, so I, I just don't even, but, but if you're 25 and you know, you've got your client list as your aunt, uh, I don't know what you do. I don't know what you do either. Well, unfortunately that's all the time we have for today. Thanks to Dan Colbert for joining us, and thanks to all of you for listening. Tune in next week for the second half of this two-part interview with Dan Colbert. Stay safe, everybody. Thanks again for listening. Keep Craft Alive. <laughs>